I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a cold Thursday afternoon late in the fall and I was in my second year of seminary when I pulled into the Jiffy Lube near the campus to get an oil and filter change. I was still driving my very first car, a red Chevy Chevette hatchback. I pulled into the proper lane and the attendant asked what I needed, took my keys and showed me the customer waiting room. A few minutes later, a large man in a blue jumpsuit walked in, staring more at the red rag he was using to wipe some of the grease that covered his hands than he was at me, but he came over and he asked if I was the owner of the red Chevette. Oh dear, I was a little bit intimidated and I thought either something is really wrong with this car or he hates the bumper sticker on the back of it. Yes, on the back fender was a large bumper sticker proclaiming, I oppose the death penalty. In those brief seconds, I have to confess that I made all kinds of assumptions about this large burly man in front of me, assuming that we didn't have much in common. The words that poured out of his mouth, however, were in the form of a question. And he simply asked, why? Why do you oppose the death penalty. Well, I was so surprised I stammered something about uh, thou shalt not kill being one of the Ten Commandments. And then, then I started blabbering on about the precious gift of life. And frankly, I don't know what else I said. But this mechanic standing in front of me, he said, you know why I oppose the death penalty? Because we're playing God. And killing someone denies the love and power of God to work a miracle in that person's life. Wow. In an instant, he turned all of my assumptions upside down. He took the truth of the commandment and added to it. He extended its meaning, drawing out some of its larger implications. Not just that we shouldn't kill or murder, but affirming God's continuing and active presence in the world to change lives. That experience happened over 35 years ago, but it remains a bold memory for me even now. Have you ever had an experience like that? Today, today we're in our second week of a series on the Sermon on the Mount, guided by a book with the same name by Amy Jill Levine. This most famous sermon is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7. You might remember that Jesus, having climbed up a mountain, sat down and began to teach his disciples. The crowds are listening nearby, and Jesus starts with the Beatitudes, those words of encouragement regarding the human condition. McGray preached on them last week. And then the next section of chapter 5 continues, and it continues for the next 35 verses, of which we only read 10. Jesus begins to talk about what everybody knows to be conventional wisdom or, or maybe a kind of shared ethic. And in each of these verses, Jesus is proclaiming the law, the Jewish code to live by and profoundly expands upon its wisdom. It's what Dr. Levine calls the extensions. Jesus is calling Israel, God's chosen people, to be the light of the world, and he's forging a new path, opening a way, pleading and encouraging his followers to join him on this sometimes dangerous and very meaningful journey. Yes, Jesus keeps the law and extends it. Now, why do I say this calling is a dangerous journey? Well, when you think about what was going on in Palestine in 30 AD, you realize there was a lot of danger for Jesus and his followers. In truth, Israel had many enemies. Pagan nations ruled the land and were subjecting the people to harsh regulations and unjust taxes. There was national conflict and even conflicts within the Jewish community. The people Jesus was talking to that day, they were regularly subjected to abuse, oppression, and violence at the hands of the occupying Romans. They were often insulted, humiliated, slapped, beaten, and even killed if they openly resisted. It was into this setting that Jesus is teaching. And he gives lots of examples for righteous living in the midst of their reality. 
You see, he is trying to teach them the concept of holiness, grace-filled kingdom living. He raises the bar, if you will, for the way his followers are to behave toward one another, inviting them to live into the spirit of the law and not simply the letter of it. It's like he's offering a new kind of justice, a creative, healing, restorative justice. Yes, in this section, Jesus uses a formula. You have heard that it was said. And then he gives some acknowledged truth and adds, but I say to you. And then he extends or he fills out its meaning. Six times Jesus uses this formula. And I would like to explore two of them with you today. The first, you have heard that it was said to those who live long ago, don't commit murder. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. So to this command not to commit murder, he speaks against anger. This extension is meant to convey the seriousness of angry words. The seriousness of angry words. Sit with that for a minute. Sit with that as you think about our recent events, the political climate in our country, white supremacy and racial unrest across our society. Getting closer to home, what about the harsh words mumbled under your breath at your unreasonable boss or hurled at a coworker with whom you disagree? What about the damage done to your partner when the stress of your day is taken out on them? Even worse, the wounding of a child who is bullied by another. Yes, the seriousness of angry words is real and they can do deep and long lasting harm. And just like in our day, it happened in Jesus's day too. Back then it was the Romans insulting the Jews or the Samaritans attacking the Jews and the Jews fighting back. It was a violent society kind of like a local politician or speaker making a gesture gesture of disdain or disapproval at their opposition. And someone on the other side reacts angrily. Soon a bunch of people are on their feet shouting at the top of their lungs and hurling insults at each other. Before long, knives come out. Prior to the authorities arriving on the scene, two people are dead. The other side vows revenge. The next day, some innocent bystander is attacked and on and on it goes. Words matter. Words matter and angry words can bring violent destruction. As the Senate chaplain Barry Black said 11 days ago, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Is that what life is? is meant to be like. I mean, if Israel is supposed to be the light of the world and Jesus has come to call Israel back to its true vocation, its true calling, then what's to be done? And how can this kind of anger be diffused and prevented from spilling over into violence and even murder? Jesus speaks of de-escalation. It's like he's saying, let's take it down a notch. Let's not ever get so angry with each other that we would even have the thought that we might want someone dead. But how in the world are we to do that? Jesus offers two specific and practical commands. They sound quite simple, but they are oh so hard. Be reconciled and make friends. That's it. Put things right and resolve conflicts. In verse 24, it says, make things right with your brother or sister. And then in this case, come back to the altar to worship. In verse 25, make sure to make friends quickly with your opponents. <laughs> Give me a break, Jesus. That, that's impossible. And it is, of course, until we look directly at Jesus, at his words and actions, his life and his love. 
Theologian N.T. Wright reminds us that as we continue through Matthew's gospel, we discover that natural question of how. How can people possibly do what he says? And we learn Jesus himself is the answer. Jesus refused to go the way of anger. Instead, he took the anger of his enemies and died under its load. From that point on, reconciliation is not just something, an ideal to strive for. It's an achievement, an accomplishment we must now embody. An achievement, an accomplishment we must express with our very lives. Whew. And Jesus is just getting started in his sermon, talking about how disciples are to live. You think murder is prohibited, Jesus says? Don't even think about getting angry. You think adultery is wrong? <laughs> you better take a look at the passions of your heart. And then he says, verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn the left cheek to them as well. When they wish to haul you to court, take your shirt with them, let them have your coat too. And when they force you to go one mile, Go with them too. What the heck, Jesus? I mean, that's not right. It's impossible. And to be honest, at first blush, it sounds uh, to me like a little bit of weak, meek and mild doormat religion, like a religion that doesn't have the will to stand up and resist evil and challenge injustice. But looking more intently at this extension, we note that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, appears in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. It is deeply ingrained in our psyche. And this law makes allowance for justice that demands an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a life for a life, right? Don't let yourself get pushed around. Give back as good as you get. In other words, fair is fair. But in that system, everyone goes around half blind and toothless. As Gandhi said, an eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. So really, it seems this has more to do with compensation for damage to one's body parts. And Dr. Levine believes that this teaching is designed to prevent escalation of violence because an eye for an eye, it equalizes all bodies, rich or poor bodies, Light or dark skinned bodies, Gentile or Jew, all, all are made in the very image of God. So this phrase limits vengeance. The punishment should not exceed the crime. You can't take more than what you lost. But then Jesus goes on and starts talking about turning the other cheek. I mean, what does that mean? And giving away your coat after they've already sued you for your shirt. And even going two miles after a Roman soldier forces you to carry his pack for one. Jesus knew that there were and still are two basic ways to relate to the authority and power of an oppressor. The first way is to accept it and all the abuses that go with it. Cooperate and collaborate. The second way is to engage in active resistance. In Jesus' day, the Zealots were an armed resistance organization that attacked and harassed Roman soldiers. But here, right here, Jesus is offering a third option, a third way, a way of nonviolent resistance. It is what was taught by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrate tomorrow. A third way, nonviolent resistance, restores the identity and dignity of the victim. And it preserves the hope, at least, for reconciliation and peace. For example, say a Jewish resident was slapped in the face by a Roman official, and instead of striking back, which probably would have cost their life, in place of striking back or dropping to the floor begging for mercy, if instead this citizen proudly offers the other cheek, well, at that moment, there's a profound change in the situation. This one is now resisting nonviolently. This was clearly made visible for me when I was worshiping with a small group of Christians in El Salvador in 1987. You might remember that in the early 80s, there was a lot of political unrest in El Salvador. There were death squads and a frightening military dictatorship in control. And 
This was our text that day. I remember a woman reflecting on turning the other cheek and saying she didn't think that Jesus wanted her or any of them to be walked on and abused. And then she said, so when a soldier goes to hit me, I pause and I look him right in the eye and I ask why. Why are you hitting me? She continued, he may still hit me, but at least for a second, he has to look at me as a human being made in God's image. I think she's right. Because when we, what we see in the teachings and life of Jesus is that people mattered. Human relationships matter to God. The way we are treated and treat others matters to God. So rather than escalating the violence or losing one's personal dignity, expose the wrongness of the situation. The oppressed one is now an active part and equal in the situation and not merely a victim, a full human being, not simply an object of abuse. And this courageous action robs the oppressor of the power to humiliate. Now, I want to add an acquaintance of mine whom I really admire added this. Let's be clear. This is not a prescription for foreign policy when one's country is being invaded. It's not a mandate to cooperate with someone who's threatening to harm your child. But it is an invitation to a whole new way of thinking about religion. Indeed, every, behind every one of these formulas or issues, there's a deeper way to understand the gospel ethic. And according to Jesus, it's not enough to simply keep the letter of the law. That's just the starting point. God wants more from us than memorizing and obeying the rules and avoiding wrongdoing and sin. God wants responsible, imaginative people who know the rules and grapple with them. People who try to understand and follow both their spirit and their intention. You know, I've heard people say that the problem with this section of the Sermon on the Mount is that it is easy to dismiss as some sort of simple reminder to be nice to people. And that might be true until we realize that at the heart of Jesus' message in Matthew is a message essential for what it means to be the church today. As we look around at the great divisions in our country, within our neighborhoods, in our families, and even within our own hearts, Jesus says, reconcile. Make friends across the divides. De-escalate the violence. Be creative in how you do this. Love your enemy. In short, Jesus came so we would be different. And Jesus teaches us what that different light looks like. And then... He gives his very life so we can be set free to live that life too. Will you pray with me? Oh God, send your spirit upon us and light our path that we may travel the road you have prepared for us. Enable our hearts and minds to more fully understand your goodness and grace. And help us embrace the life-giving work of your spirit. Help us resist the evils and temptations of this world so we may truly follow the way of kingdom living. Amen.